Shri Guru Namaha. Good morning and uh, firstly thanks to Prabhu Bharat for giving me this opportunity and organizing this wonderful meeting of minds and hearts on topics of national importance. But it's very inspired by that uh, vision, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. We've already heard a few perspectives about uh, democracy and governance. There's also been a bit of apprehension and probably the most sophisticated tradition of political thought, tracing all the way back from Mahabharata. If you look at the uh, most erudite political philosophy, to the most uh, sophisticated and spiritual vision of what politics is for, uh, I think a lot of times we have been the spiritual vision for politics has been realized in India for a long time now. And I think our greatest text on political philosophy begins with that. It says that the sum total of all knowledge, doesn't matter with what your pursuit is in life, ultimately if it does not lead to yoga kshema, if it does not lead to loka samgraha, if it does not lead to governance and politics as a means for realizing that, uh, then that pursuit is really not uh, considered to be worthwhile uh, in the Indian tradition. So. Uh, I know that there is a misgiving about politics, but I think we should shed that. Politics is the means for governance. Politics is the means for Loka Samgraha. And I think it's in that spirit that I'd like to talk to you about uh, the topic of democracy, uh, contemporary perspectives on democracy, but also what is the Indian take on democracy and where we are as a nation and uh, as the uh, democratic polity that we hear a lot about, but uh, there are sometimes uh, not enough opportunities for us to think deeply about what it means. I think the, uh, the challenge of governance has been recognized for a long time, but I, uh, I particularly uh, find this observation by uh, Sri uh, Chakravati Rajgopal Chariji very, very prescient. Uh, at the time of independence, yet uh, very clearly laid out what are the challenges for this nation, uh, whatever form of governance that we've chosen, we've chosen democracy, uh, and uh, uh, there is a purpose of uh, welfare through it. And he said there are three challenges. Uh, how do you secure welfare? without surrendering your uh, individual liberty, uh, to not let the state swallow what is the freedom that all of us have. We spoke about the village systems. And how do you create this balance between this entity called state that we need to do the things that we cannot do as individuals, but at the same time not lose the freedom that we have, both as individuals and as collectives in villages. He also mentioned uh, the link between the, uh, uh, no, the real pulse that a democracy runs on is that I have an agency and I'm able to see the impact of that agency. Therefore, there is a feedback loop of trust between the citizen and the state. And he recognized this more presciently than perhaps anybody else when he said there should be a link between the taxes you pay and the service that you get. And he also said, and this is quintessentially Indian, most countries in modern democracies would stop at that because the whole idea of rights takes over the idea of dharma or duty. So the concept is almost absent. But because this is a thinker deeply seeped in Indian thought, he said the final purpose of Indian democracy should be to actually help us blend our spiritual with the material. And I think that is the challenge that uh, you know, we all face today. And uh, you know, what we talk about in terms of democracy is an assessment on whether the state, the collective, the institutions that we've given ourselves are able to deliver on all these three counts. Are they able to help you preserve your freedoms? Are they able to give you a good contract between your tax and the service that you get, but most critically, are they able to uh, really guide you in terms of blending your spiritual and material pursuits in life, because that has always been the Indian way. This whole idea that it is only esoteric or it is completely political is alien to India. India is the genius of fusing the binaries. And I think this is uh, represented uh, uh, most recently and most assertively, I would say, uh, when uh, Narendra Modi ji announced at UNGA recently that I come from the country which is called the mother of democracy. There's been a bit of opposition to that. Uh, quite a few scholars in academic circles have started uh, complaining about it. But I would say that their uh, take on it is uh, not scientific. Uh, there's any uh, amount of research available that democratic spirit in India is not because of a colonial experience. Uh, it is because of our civilization that we are a democracy. We are not a civilization because we are democratic. I think he assertively uh, gave us this uh, not just the vision, but also confidence to go out and proclaim that we represent a tradition of working for people and giving agency to people. It is because we have that ideal of a civilizational vision that democracy is such a natural fit uh, for India. Uh, you know, yesterday I was uh, listening to Miraji's speech and he spoke about uh, his journey from being in the sciences to uh, you know, what we would call liberal arts and social sciences. 
Uh, I thought it would be important for us to just take a few uh, disciplines and key ideas from those disciplines when we try and analyze or develop a perspective on things like democracy. Uh, because what is happening today is really, and I think uh, the whole uh, vision of Prabhu Bharat also represents that quite uh, well, that you need to blend perspectives from the social, the technological, the economic and the political together. It just means that you need to have a multidisciplined approach to things and you need to develop a multidisciplined mind. So as somebody who is uh, involved in teaching and working with young people to help them develop a multidisciplined mind, what are the sort of ideas that you need to mix together? If you look at it, I, I look at political science, you get some ideas around nation state, power structures, you look at public policy, how do we solve problems of collective choice, look at psychology, philosophy, economics, institutionalism, socialism, or sociology and uh, history. I would urge that anybody who is thinking about uh, democracy, politics, governance, we first try and locate some of these disciplines and the key ideas. What are the first principles that we get from these disciplines? And how do we develop a complex, complicated, but a morally elevating perspective around any of the structures that we have? And I would say that there is a lot of work to be done by, by those particularly who espouse a civilizational vision on these disciplines. We have to master these disciplines, understand and engage with practitioners of those disciplines, and develop, rooted in our worldview, a different take towards the vision of Yogiksham. So it's a bit of context around, uh, I thought I'll do two things today. Uh, one, talk a little bit about the global context on democracy and the challenges that democracies face. And then, uh, you know, what is the Indian uh, method to address those? We're all familiar with this, uh, uh, Francis Fukuyama's uh, favorite, uh, or you know, most famous saying that uh, we've reached the end of history. Uh, back in 1990s when the Berlin Wall fell, he mentioned that uh, the history project is over. It's not so much that history won't be created. As long as human affairs and civilizations continue, there would be history. Uh, but what he meant really was that we've achieved the pinnacle. We now have a recipe that we can transfer and just sort of implement all over the world. A combination of uh, democracy in politics, free market, and uh, individual liberty, this combination can now be exported to all parts of the world. It just took us less than 20 years for that story to fall flat. Not just in India or anywhere else in the world, but in the same land, in the same sort of civilization that this idea sprung from, that we've reached the end of history. If you just go, go up to, you know, we've seen it with the recent US elections, the, the whole uh, criticism around EVMs that we see here seem to have found resonance in US as well, because there is a question mark around the sanctity of elections, which is really you know, the most basic ingredient of uh, elections or democracy, uh, has been questioned in the land of uh, democracy itself. Right? Uh, so if you just go forward, there are a couple of seminal movements in the last five, 10 years that have really given challenges to democracy. Uh, the rise of what they consider to be the authoritative right, along with uh, events like Brexit and the uh, attack on Capitol Hill leading up to US elections. All of these things have put uh, a bit of a question mark on the idea of liberal democracy as the, uh, the pinnacle of human achievement of social organization or political organization. Right? So there is, as we speak today about democracy in India, there is actually a deep catharsis that's going on uh, in the rest of the world as well. And uh, it is therefore not just an opportunity for us, but also a responsibility that we have that we provide some new perspectives on what democracy really means and what is the spiritual and the yogic vision that we can have that can actually inform and guide the polity. But there is also a new claimant uh, to this and they have proclaimed a new model of uh, state-led capitalism. And uh, that is a big challenge for liberal democracy all over the world. That if you can have a single party system and if you can actually deliver decent public services to people, why do you need this complicated, complex arrangement of multiple parties, contestations, this entire charade sometimes of you know, going through consultation, uh, this asymmetry that we see between power and people who are sort of uh, the recipients of that power, right? But that is challenging the idea of liberal democracy. So when we think about democracy in India, the macro context also has to be considered. Uh, and if we just uh, look at this conceptually, uh, Danny Roddick had given this famous uh, framework, which I find very useful to analyze the political developments. There are three big macro trends in the world. One is the political trend of an organization of the world as nation states. I think well, some of us are aware of the history of this, particularly those who studied history and political science would be familiar about how we've arrived at nation states. Secondly, there is also the whole idea of uh, globalization 
and globalization, particularly as one economic philosophy of free markets, which is then exported and the world is looked at as one free zone for economic activity. There's been a recent book on the balance that we need to strike uh, between these two. But there is also the idea of democracy. Now, if you look at these three things, globalization, democracy, and the idea of political unit as a nation state, they are fundamentally mutually incompatible. They cannot all three exist together. The challenge or the uh, sort of schizophrenia that you see or the dissonance that we see in political uh, discourse is simply that leaders today are forced to balance all three. They have to talk up all three dimensions, knowing fully well that you cannot balance all three. And Danny Roddick says that at some point you will have to take a choice. Either you promote democracy and nation state, which means by default your globalization will have to come down, simply because the uh, fruits of economic globalization might not be equitable. Or you promote democracy and globalization, but forget the idea of nation state, because your boundaries don't make sense, because boundaries actually increase the transaction costs, and transaction costs means that you cannot have democracy. Right? So this complex arrangement, uh, which is why we see that leaders are having to go and talk to, uh, uh, let's say, a company in the West and talk up globalization, but then come back to India and talk up uh, you know, local and uh, local promotion. This dichotomy, sometimes it might also lead to a distaste about politics itself, is something that is real. And all of us need to get comfortable with this dual reality. And the charge or the sort of leadership today is to navigate all of us uh, as citizens, as people in a common polity, together in this complex maze. So we also have to become a little bit more aware around the challenges that leaders are facing. It has to be a reciprocal kind of arrangement where we understand the message in a certain context. Also smart enough to decode and understand to what context and to what limit that message applies in. Right? So if that is the inescapable trilemma, what is the Indian context? Uh, if we understand that this is the global uh, sort of context that we are operating in, does India have a perspective? What would be India's response to understand and decode this complexity? So firstly, the story of democracies itself. Uh, Dr. Indu Vishnathanji had uh, given this infographic just a few days ago on Twitter. Uh, this is a comparison, it's not scale, but it's a comparison between the US democracy and Indian democracy. Uh, for the last 300, 400 years. Uh, you look at US, uh, 1776 to 1954 is when you could actually say that the fundamental condition of one person, one vote, regardless of skin, caste, religion, for almost 200 years of democracy, that country did not have that. And compare and contrast that with India, 1950, when constitution was adopted, took a huge leap. In fact, uh, there were many, including Swami Vivekananda, who also said that this is something that needs to be thought about. Right? But India took that great leap, and those who said that uh, at the time, in, in 1950s, uh, quite a few uh, thinkers and academicians, uh, if you will, were worried that in a nation which is uh, you know, thinking about a rice bowl, just a meal, the next meal, you cannot really talk about democracy. But if you fast forward to not just 70 years, but I would say even within the first 40, 50 years, I think the idea of democracy deepened. We, we, I think a critical examination of what it led to is due, but uh, it is indisputable that people have taken up. And I think this is what is represented in uh, Modiji's statement when he says that uh, we are the uh, mother of democracy. Again, he is exhorting uh, uh, or is all asking all of us to understand that it is not a result of what happened in 1947, but it is a result of certain civilizational ideas that we have which makes democracy possible. And I believe that it is those ideas that also gave the confidence for India to go ahead and leap into what took 200 years for US to do. But uh, if you look at the just the uh, appraisal of democracy in India, uh, I think we are a functional democracy, civil liberties, uh, regardless of uh, some debates that you see, and there should always be those contestations, particularly around uh, sedition law, internet uh, uh, kind of shutdowns, and what happens uh, when there is conflict. Uh, but what I find, just, just uh, analyzing that uh, debate around whether India is really democratic or not, when we hear these criticisms, is that it does not take into account the real nature of conflict today, particularly in a technology, social media driven world where a national sovereignty issue can spread like wildfire, lead, uh, leading to physical violence. Uh, if you're not able to frame the debate in the context of national security, I think that is a disservice. 
That is also, I think, indicative of what makes a democracy work. Democracy will work only when the quality of debate by everyone who is contesting is of a certain standard. And I think uh, everyone who is opposing the government or uh, uh, state, and this is regardless of which party is in power, it is the responsibility for citizens to engage in debate which is productive at the end of the day. And that, uh, I would say, is probably one of the weaknesses. But if you look at the uh, whole element of competition in elections, peaceful transfer of power, you just need to look at your neighboring states, what happens in Pakistan, what happens in Sri Lanka with just two languages, uh, and what happens in India with this kind of complexity. That in such a complex polity with so many pulls and pressures, power transfer has never been a violent issue, except what we've seen in West Bengal, highlighted by all intellectual scholars, active citizens. That this is, uh, you know, if there is one danger to democracy and to like, those who really value and uh, talk to us about democracy, I think West Bengal post poll violence uh, stands out as a black day or a black event in the history of Indian democracy. It is inclusive, as we've seen, uh, 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 you know, uh, there is representation from different social segments, different religions, different regions. Indian democracy, I think, uh, has a moral claim to be one of the most inclusivist uh, human experiments ever. And lastly, uh, you know, I, we are speaking today about democracy and politics, uh, but just think about the last two years. I was thinking about what is the context in which we are having this conversation. An unprecedented health crisis at a global scale, wars on both your uh, fronts, the Western Front and constant trouble on, obviously, on the Eastern Front as well. Right? Then you have uh, uh, situations like Kashmir and CAA. Then you have uh, uh, the whole agitation on farm laws. To look at what has occupied political mind space and leadership attention in the last two years and managing the economy and politics and security amidst all of this, I feel, uh, I feel that we are blessed uh, in a certain way that we have a stable functional leadership that is able to navigate through this uh, phase. If this kind of uh, uh, struggle was to be combined with political volatility, then you would have actually seen significant uh, higher risk to the integrity of the nation itself. Right? So you now when I talk about democracy today or purpose of politics, uh, I'm also grateful to the kind of stability that we have as a nation, so we're able to have this dialogue. So there are four challenges, and uh, I'll probably end here uh, with one more slide. Uh, it is functional, but we are seeing challenges at four levels, and I think uh, occasions like this, audience like this, the whole uh, institutional uh, arrangement to think about issues uh, should help us resolve these four issues. Uh, as I see it, uh, Indian democracy today and Indian polity uh, by large has four fundamental fractures or fault lines that we need to address. And this will not happen uh, through the frameworks that our modern history making and modern curriculum making has given us. Uh, I submit to you today that it needs a different kind of thinking uh, to go back to our civilizational ideas. And I'll talk a little bit about what that is. But uh, there is a chasm, there is a gap between individual versus collective. We are seeing this in new emergent debates like uh, uh, privacy. Right? We also have challenges of uh, fights over public purse, collective versus collective. There's also the challenge of how do you synthesize tradition and modernity, and how do you balance the short-term exigencies because you have a political design of five-year election cycles with the long-term sort of needs which probably need you to work for 20 years. How do you create an incentive or an acceptance for things that go beyond five years? So this is the intellectual, social, cultural work ahead of us that we need to constantly work through this and provide a resolution. And if you have to really think about a solution here, I think there are two fundamental uh, uh, axioms that we need to think about. Uh, leadership, is it about an individual or is there something called an institutional leadership? And if there is an institutional leadership, what is that combination? What is that alchemy? Uh, what does that look like? So I would, uh, you know, this is the work that we do at Rastrum School of Public Leadership that, uh, that trains young people on governance and public policy. That we feel there are three Shaktis, to borrow Sri Aurobindo's philosophical and metaphorical uh, vision of Bharat is Shakti. We need three Shaktis to come together today. First one is Icha Shakti, the power of the will. Right? And this is represented in political leadership. You also need Jnana Shakti. You need the idea or the power of knowledge to work for you. And you need Kriya Shakti, the Shakti of action. Because these are the three realms that give you the fundamental concerns of any nation. Identity, the question of who we are. Stability, the question of how we come together to be stable. 
and prosperity. The idea of how we come together to actually use our creativity to create welfare. And if you map what are the spaces that the society has to give us thought and action on this, if you look at the role that academia plays, it should be about clarifying who we are. If you look at the role that politics plays, it should be about creating the idea of who we are through a procedural process that goes into the minds and hearts of all of us. And if you think about what is the role that a society has, society has the role of actually using these ideas in different areas to develop prosperity. So these three shaktis, academia, politics, and civil society, how do we develop certain competencies? How do we develop thought? How do we develop, most importantly, a bit of collaboration amongst all these sections? Is the, uh, uh, is the sort of thinking that uh, is going on uh, where I come from? And uh, this is the idea of uh, Samanvaya. And uh, I will just end with the Indian perspective on governance, which is encapsulated uh, the idea that we get from the tradition of Rajadharma. Rajadharma is considered to be the highest of all dharmas. Uh, if you follow Shantiparva, if you look at Arthashastra, because it is through Rajadharma that all other dharmas are protected. We can exercise what is really our dharmic duty when there is a stable macro condition. And nobody needs to understand this uh, uh, better than Indians because we've been through that history. And we know what happens when your macro environment gets disturbed. Right? And if you look at Rajadharma uh, and the idea of linking in individual elevation, I mentioned a yogic idea of leadership, a yogic vision for democracy. It comes to us uh, in the form of Chanakya or Kautilya Sutta, which links at one point the institution and the idea of yoga Shema to the work that we do on ourselves and mastering our senses. Tanakya uh, uh, gives us this wonderful uh, sukta, uh, uh, says that the ultimate purpose is obviously sukha or welfare, but the basis for sukha is dharma, the fact that all of us are able to perform our duties in an interdependent manner. But dharma itself is based on artha or prosperity or a sense of well-being. So if society that does not experience well-being automatically gets into envy and jealousy and you do not build anything out of envy and jealousy. But Artha itself is possible when there is something called a country, when you have a clarity around what is yours and what is not yours. To protect that, you need a leadership or you need a king in those uh, times who is Indriya Vijay, who is able to master his or her senses. This to me is the philosophical vision for democracy that if you want a larger vision of public welfare of yoga Shema, the medium to that is democracy and leadership and the path or the work is actually on a yogic plane to master your senses. And it goes on to explain what is Indriya Vijay and if we get this from multiple Upanishads as well, it is the Shet Sampad, it is the idea of uh, Bhumukshatva, it is the idea of uh, Vairagya, it is the idea of Viveka and uh, all of these ideas together which are about human development uh, tells us the link between how we develop ourselves to how the polity is arranged. So I end there on the context of what are the challenges that democracy faces, what is the Indian uh, perspective on this, and what can we draw from our civilizational experience to think about a uh, vision for democracy itself for the world. Thank you. Sir, I am Dr. Chandrakant Tukshetti. My question to the second speaker, Dr. Sri Raghava, is that you spoke about the leadership and the basic ingredient of the leadership has to be Vaira and Mahabhushatva followed by Yoga Kshema. We have heard our leaders speaking about the Yoga Kshema quite often, however platonic and superficial it could be. But you cited Chanakya's, Arthashastra, Kampiyas, etc. Is there any mechanism of, mechanism of converting these concepts into practicality of choosing the leadership and eligibility for the leadership to contest the elections today because elected leaders are supposed to be the supreme today. So if it, that is to be held as supreme, we'll have to devise a mechanism of choosing the contestant and hopeful to be the leaders. Could you throw some light upon that? Yeah, thank you for that question because uh, uh, it also allows me to talk a little bit about the work that we are trying to do. Uh, I agree, talking about these principles without actually instrumenting the, uh, the path or the procedure is futile. Right? You, can, uh, you can talk about these things in an academic, intellectual manner, 
uh, if it doesn't translate into a mechanism for you to elect your leaders, if the system does not provide you that, uh, then it is just confined to these spaces, right? Uh, but I would, uh, I would locate the problem slightly more upstream, sir, uh, uh, you know, with due respect. Are we capable of identifying such a person? Are we capable of actually going, somebody, our next generation, going through the education and the social system that we have today uh, to actually develop those faculties? Because it takes somebody to have that faculty to recognize that at a higher level in a potential leader. I would say that there is a lot of work, firstly, for us to be uh, doing and focusing on, on the quality of education itself, right? On the, uh, on the fundamental philosophical and worldview formation that's happening through the education that we have given ourselves. And this is, uh, this is not an intellectual challenge. This is, I say this as a parent. I say I have a, a young daughter and I look at, and I, because I interact with a lot of young people, I, I see the uh, moral vision that they have, but I also see that uh, you know, we have not given them the means to raise their own self-awareness and to actually engage in developing that kind of what we call Viveka, right? Unless we are able to do that, then leadership is essentially a representation or a reflection of how we are in, in some senses. It is, it is a, uh, I would say that is a necessary condition for us to actually instrument it. It is not perhaps sufficient, I agree with you. Even if you have a highly evolved uh, public, your political leadership might still not be because there is a asymmetry of incentives, particularly when you look at what we call in public policy the moral hazards of a principal agent relationship that we have in representative democracy. But I think uh, the, without that condition, we'll not be able to redesign or actually even use the mechanisms that we have to the effect that they should. Right? Uh, so I agree with you, uh, we, we lack those mechanisms to elect and identify those leaders who are uh, sort of demonstrating those civilizational virtues. Uh, but I think uh, I am a great believer and optimist in Bharat Samaj. Uh, I think the land and the polity, Tulji beautifully said, a lot of this debate happens because we are in these spaces, uh, but I also genuinely believe that the uh, natural tendency of Bharat is to identify what is good and what is not good, what is dharmic and what is not dharmic. Uh, the polity and the elite capture of policy should not kill that spirit. That is one care that we need to take. Uh, but my focus, given where I am today, uh, is on education. How do you develop new theories of governance and public leadership? Like I said, how do you get academia, civil society, and political leadership together to agree that firstly these are the values, and then create a praxis, what we call a practice way for you to develop, because this is not a theory, this is through sadhana, this is through, somebody said chiti, right? Uh, how do you identify the uh, fundamental chiti of a person? How do you then create sobhava, sodharma alignment? There is a lot of work happening in uh, education now. Uh, it needs to be scaled up. There is also support from policy as I see it today that it is encouraging. It will take us a generation, but you will hit a tipping point where not just because we have a higher moral virtue uh, in the educational vision we have, but also because the current trajectory that I painted uh, in terms of where liberal democracy is headed today is also able to see the crisis itself. It does not need even India to tell it that. There is a danger and people are able to see the limits. What we need to do is provide a better alternative. Uh, sir, Namaste. I am Dr. Basuraj Bindi from Ballari University. As rightly you have mentioned throughout your deliberations, both of you, <coughs> democracy, political democracy, and somewhere you have brought Chanakya with the Dharma. Today, I think democracy and political democracy and Dharma are unlinked, delinked. We are talking today the honest corrupt and the dishonest corrupt. What is your take on these two terms? With reference to democracy, political democracy, and today, whole country is witnessing of uh, the literature of a percentage sarkar. What is, these are the two critical issues. I think we are sending a message to the younger generations and these are getting seen into the brain and these brains may become, you know, the seed becomes a tree and they yield a wrong roots in the uh, future generation. Thank you very much. So the issue of corruption, and I think uh, uh, there would be any amount of debate on this, uh, Clearly, uh, it shows that the character building process is broken, right? both uh, you know, in terms of the leadership uh, that comes through politics and uh, the very definition of politics, uh, go to William Gladstone, uh, says that it should be uh, to make it easy for the good people to do the right things and make it harder for 
immoral or the corrupt to do the wrong things, right? Uh, there are two dimensions to this. I brought that question up for reflection. Uh, one is, uh, we tend to immediately hark on uh, the individuals, okay? uh, but there is an institutional design to this. Uh, and there are institutional de deficiencies in the process of democracy itself within India, uh, with the kind of design that we've given. I brought out one question about uh, the challenge that we have in reconciling the short-term uh, exigencies that any political leadership will face versus the things that you really need to do which will take 15, 20, 25 years. Uh, so there is a design fault there, right? Uh, there's also the challenge that we have in terms of the uh, political process of uh, first-past-the-post system. Uh, thinkers like Dr. Jayaprakash Narayanji have spoken about it. I find it useful to think also about the institutional mechanisms that we've given ourselves. Uh, apart from, of course, uh, my entire uh, focus was on character building and education as a means for character building. That is critical. There is no substitute to integrity of the individual. But at the same time, your uh, incentives and the resource allocation and the fusion of accountability and ownership uh, is missing. There are mechanisms that we get from other uh, democracies. Some of those can be adopted in terms of what does a good public consultation process look like? What does a good participative process look like? Uh, but at the end of the day, if you're not able to fuse the institutional mechanisms with the integrity of the individual or a way to build people of integrity, uh, I found, at least in my limited survey, that uh, depending on just one or the other, like we tend to depend on the individual that I've seen in the Indian context, and I've also seen an excessive dependence on the idea of institutions coming from the West. Uh, I, my personal belief is that unless you're able to bring these things together, and that obviously is a intellectual, academic, social work. Uh, if you're not able to bring this together, then we will continue to have the same debate uh, long after you know, this, this forum. Uh, I think the opportunity is there in education, social, and political leadership coming together, sir. Myself, Pasora Jimba. My question to Sri Raghava, sir. Sir, to occupy any public post, qualifications are described. Whereas to occupy a political post, my qualifications are not described. And as my knowledge goes, Ambedkar, when he chaired to write the constitution, he was bent upon to prescribe a qualification to the politicians. Why that has not been implemented? It's a, a favorite topic, right? And, and uh, this is not a reflection of the impact of the speech, it's just a reflection of the concern that animates all of us, which is about our quality of public leadership. Uh, so to your question, uh, I think we will have to re-examine the idea of qualification itself. Right? Uh, I agree with you. Uh, I mentioned I used the word integrity. Uh, there is, I don't think, a bigger uh, qualification than integrity and intent. Right? Uh, that is ultimately the only currency that a leader has. We've seen this in our own organizations. We've seen this, uh, uh, you know, if you are running an academic in institution or if you are, uh, you know, just running a classroom that the only currency that a leader has is trust. And trust is based on character and competence. And at every single point in time, your actions, your behavior, your interactions are being calibrated by the people around you. And there is a meter that is running on your trust, right? Uh, for a leader to actually soak in this pressure, that there are millions of people, depending on the range of your uh, work, uh, observing me, judging me every minute, even when nobody is watching directly, and to calibrate my actions. Again, you cannot do that unless you go through a sadhana. The Indian method to this has not been theoretical. The Indian method to this is how do you develop vairagya? The whole answer to the question of what is the qualification for leadership is in vairagya and viveka. That you grow by giving, that you have the ability to do tyaga. These are the civilizational the ideas that we get there are complications, obviously, in a competitive. I want to be empathetic to the uh, political sphere. It's, it's easy for us to notice this because, you know, it's, it's a theater at the end of the day and we are uh, recipients of the drama. But what we call a state is much bigger than just the executive, right? There is obviously uh, the legislature, there is the judiciary. There's a lot more that's happening that is beyond and behind uh, our 